understood that there were times where I talk and then times where I listen, and, and that was a big step in relationship too, to sort of sit and listen. And then there was a season where I understood that there was a depth that came from just being present. And it's, it's praying, but it feels different, and it, it's behold him. It's spending your time entering into the presence of God and then just being there not expressing your thoughts or ideas, not listening for some profound voice of wisdom, but just enjoying being present with God. And I think that song speaks to what that type of prayer is. And so before we lose the moment, I wanna spend some time doing that. So why don't you stand where you're at? I'm gonna open us in prayer and invite you to just behold him, to enter into his presence, to stand before God, to hear anything he may have to say, but more than that, to just enjoy being in God's presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, that you continue to train us from the time we're young children or new believers, God that there is growth in our lives and that part of that growth is, is growing in how we engage in relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that we will have spent the opportunity already sharing our hearts with you, speaking what's on our minds during worship, that we will have entered into your presence and heard from you. And in this moment, Lord, in this holy space, in this time, I want us to just be with you, to enjoy you for who you are, for the beauty of your presence and the presence that you bring. Lord, we behold you today. Lord, by the grace and mercy that your son offered through his sacrifice on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, we are invited to be in your presence. I pray, Lord, that as our summer gets busy, as our weeks get hectic, as our lives fill with so many activities, God, I pray that we would stop, that we would stand still, that we would take advantage of the thing that you have offered us relationship, right relationship with our God, with our creator, the one who knows and understands us intimately. Lord, may we enjoy your presence and dwell in it. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, uh, my name is Rob, and I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church, and I say that as much for the people that attend here as the new people this week. Uh, it's been four weeks since I've been here on a Sunday. Uh, that is the longest time in 10 years that I haven't been uh, at a service here on a Sunday morning, and there's a few reasons for that. A couple weeks holiday, and then we had citywide service, and then uh, last Saturday, I, uh, I got a stomach bug on Saturday night, which has, I think is like maybe the second time that's ever happened, and I thought it 
wiser to stay at home than to come up on stage with my bucket. So, uh, um, so we had Matt Chandler preach last week. Uh, I am doing my best to try to get the links to the rest of the sermons. It was part of a series for those that were here. We're going to try to email those out to you so that those that want to watch it can watch the rest. There's just a little trick of figuring out how to do that with copyright stuff and all that goodness. So uh, we are working on it and we'll try to get you for those that want to watch the rest of the series, uh, the link to that. So first off, uh, I want to thank Micah Motts and Blair Woodrow who preached in my absence. Uh, I have listened to their sermons and they were wonderful. Uh, they offered a, a great insight on scripture and we're thankful for their uh, presence in our congregation and the wisdom which they brought. Uh, we are going back to the book of Philippians today. And so if you have your Bibles with you, we are in Philippians chapter 2 today. It's been a long time since we've been there, so uh, just a little bit of a, a recap. Um, this is Paul's letter to the Philippians, and he's writing it perhaps for a unique purpose. Um, a gift was brought to him. He's uh, spending some time in jail, as seemed to be Paul's practice, or at least the practice of those around him. And in his time in jail, the church in Philippians has, uh, in Philippi has sent a gift with a messenger. And so this is the letter that he sends back, both thanking them for the gift and offering some encouragement. And so in a unique way compared to most letters, there's not really a, a specific specific sin he's addressing or something he's trying to correct or rebuke. More than that, he's just writing to this group of friends that have blessed him. And so it's a letter of great encouragement, and we've experienced that together uh, as we've read it. Now, in chapter 2, there's perhaps the, the height or the center of this letter is in a poem from verse 5 through 11. And it's this poem that focuses down on who Jesus was and is. It reminds us of his sacrifice and his great humility, of his sinlessness, and of who he was in human form. And so we are given this beautiful understanding of who Christ is that is meant to to mediate both what comes before and what happens. It's saying, I want you to behave in this way because Christ came to earth and gave us this example of how to do life. And certainly this section that we're reading that immediately follows this poem is linked to the idea that Christ has displayed this practice to us. And so, I want to begin in chapter 2, verse 12, and uh, we'll look sort of in, in brief little sections. We're kind of going to go verse by verse through a shorter section this week. I know it's the long weekend, and I'm new back in the pulpit again, so we're going we're gonna to go through a short section today and do as, good as, as best as we can on it. So, chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends... As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul begins by extolling them for having been followers of Christ that always obeyed. What a high thing to say about a group of believers. They had this outward obedience. Their actions had come in line with the moral teachings of Christ, but we recognize that they still had some attitudes that need addressing, and that's coming in the following verses. But as far as sort of their outward practices go, when they became believers, when they converted to Christianity, when they became disciples of Christ, they had gotten most of those things, and, and Paul even suggests almost all of those things, in check. And this is so often the way that it happens when we're discipled by Christ, when we come under the care of the Holy Spirit, that he begins by working on our actions. There are things in our life that need to be transformed by the presence of Christ when he comes. But it's just the beginning of the work that he does. Because deeper than that is the ways that we think and is our attitudes towards things. And those are the things that Paul's going to remind them that they need to continue to work on in order to attain perspective perfection. In order to be properly in Christ, there are things that they need to, as he puts it, continue to work out. So Paul reminds them that their salvation is something that they are to continue to work out, that it's not a one-off and done thing. It's not that you make this commitment to Christ and then go back to doing whatever you were doing before, but that you're meant to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, remembering that you are serving the most holy and high God. 
And that we take our thoughts, our actions, our ideas, and we present them before Christ and allow him to speak into those things. Verse 13 picks this up again and it says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. For it is God who works within you, lest we should take pride in our holiness or believe that salvation is, is attained by our own actions, that it's us earning God. It reminds us that it is God who works in us and his will that is accomplished. And this brings these two great ideas together in closeness. And I love it because it's complex and difficult and simple and beautiful. Do we have a role in our own salvation? Yes. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Is salvation completely within God's sovereign election? Yes. Is that difficult to put together? impossible stop trying there's a mystery to salvation we have a role in it god has a role in it god's role is sovereign in all things and yet we are commanded instructed to work out our salvation there is human free will in this world and we see it all around us and there is a sovereign god and there is a difficulty in bringing those two ideas together not because they don't come together in perfection but because my weak human feeble mind can't grasp it so my personal understanding is that the wisest theologians on earth have been inadequate in their ability to explain how free will and god's sovereignty work together The wisest of them acknowledge fully that salvation is a grace of God alone, that election is his alone, and that we are commanded to work out our salvation. And so, rather than trying to figure out all the nuances of where my will is and God's sovereignty ends, or my will begins and God's sovereignty overrides, or where these two things come together, I think it's wiser just to acknowledge the grace of God in salvation. That God has offered mercy and grace to us, and that we have the opportunity to accept it and to be a part of his kingdom to be a part of what he's doing, to be transformed by his presence, to submit our wills to his will, to allow him to change and transform us, to work out our salvation in this world. Verse 14. So do everything without grumbling or arguing. I think there's a reason they put just those two ideas in one verse because this is perhaps a very difficult thing. So I want you to begin this way. Think through your week. We just had a week together. You didn't know this was happening, so it's, it's all uh, random. Think through your week. Where were there places where you were arguing or grumbling? When did you complete the tasks that were put before you but had a little attitude in doing it? Was it at work? Was it at home? I suspect many of us don't have to think very far to find a place in our lives where we did something and had grumbling and complaining in the midst of it. I have to go all the way to yesterday afternoon. And mainly because yesterday evening I read this text and so I made sure I was in check for the rest of the day. <laughs> yesterday afternoon, uh, my wife left the house for a little bit and I was left at home with the kids and uh, had some tasks to do. And so I cleaned up some old flowers and I did a few dishes the whole time grumbling that these were my tasks to do. It's amazing how far our hearts can be from God. And there was potential for it to escalate into arguing, right? Because when Stace comes home, I could certainly bring up all her ineptitudes and failures. I'm obviously joking. Somewhat. <laughs> it's easy to let a grumbling heart overtake you and then to turn it into arguing and dispute and breaks in unity. So how could I have done those tasks? What would have been the right way? I could have recognized that I love my wife and that I want to help her out. 
and that there are things she has time for and things that she doesn't, and that it's wonderful and a blessing to be able to have the time to help her out, or maybe even to own some of the tasks rather than acting like I'm helping her out. Our heart condition and our mind, how we think about things, drastically changes how we do life. And I think this is where we need to see what, what's at stake because it's not just about these petty little things like taking out garbage or doing some dishes. It's about aligning your heart with Christ in a way that leads to righteousness. It's about turning your heart towards him and saying, God, there's things about me that just aren't right. You just, Paul just outlaid for us that God came to earth, took on human form and did so in a humble way and even died on a cross for our sake. And I'm whining about throwing out the flowers that my wife put on the table a few weeks ago to make our home look pretty and smell nice. Man, how petty is that? I hope that I'm not alone in this. That as you look through your week and think through what you've accomplished and where your heart was at in different situations, that you too will recognize how petty our hearts can be and how quickly grumbling can overtake us and can escalate to full-on arguing. And I love that with this group of people, Paul recognizes you've gotten a lot of your actions in step with what Christ wants of you. There's no giant sin in your life that everyone's looking at and pointing to, but there's still this heart stuff that you need to address. There's still these things inside of you that aren't in line with Christ. And they're important too. Let's read from the beginning to verse 15a to get a feel for where he's going here. Therefore, my dear friends, as you believe, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Wow. That's the goal, that you may be blameless and pure. And in order to reach that spot, in order to work to that spot, you need to address what's in your heart. And often there's grumbling and complaining in there when we look deep. Paul reminds us that the world around these believers was a warped and crooked generation. Perhaps it's a good reminder as we look at the world around us that this has often been the case. That throughout history, most people, most believers, most moral people have looked throughout the world around them and said, this is a corrupt and, and crooked place. So I want to give you some quotes uh, from people throughout history to get a feel for this. Uh, Anthony Cooper, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury. What a, what a great name. The seventh Earl of Shaftesbury uh, said this in a speech to the House of Commons in 1843. The world today is full of fear, a fearful multitude of untutored savages, boys with dogs at their heels and other ev evidence of dissolute habits, girls who drive coal carts. I don't even know what that means, but apparently it's, it's to be frowned upon who ride astride upon horses, who drink, swear, fight, smoke, whistle, and care for nobody. The morals of children are tenfold worse than formerly. Man, other than the list, I think we all say that about the world around us sometimes, don't we? Here's the Reverend Enos Hitchcock in 1790. The free access which many young people have to romances, novels, and plays has poisoned the mind and corrupted the moral of many a promising youth. And we see this throughout history. We go all the way back to 20 BC. This is from Odes, from the book Three of Odes from Horace. Our sire's age was worse than our grandsire's. We, their sons, are more worthless than they, so in our turn we shall give the world a progeny yet more corrupt than we are. I think so often we look at the world and see that it is a warped and crooked generation. Sin has existed throughout all time. 
And sin has existed since the fall of Adam and is, is evident in times past and as an in, evident in present. That's not to say there hasn't been seasons where there's been revival or more of God's presence in the world. And the sin that society accepts as good shifts and changes over time. But there has never been a time where the world has not been saturated with sinful behaviors and thoughts, where the followers of Christ are persecuted by those around them where our ideas run counter to the general world's idea of how things should work. And Paul's instruction to this church, to this group of believers, is not to withdraw, is not to pull away from, is not to hide from, but to live without fault in such a world. To guard their hearts. To even watch their internal voice. To guide themselves against bickering, against against ideas that are not Christ-like, that lead to arguing. Paul instructs them to live in this world in a Christ-like place, and the beauty of it is that as the world moves further from Christ, our witness of Christ becomes more and more evident to those that are searching. What we have becomes more and more appealing to those who are in want and in need of a, of a God that brings center to their life of a God that transforms their hearts, of a God that brings purpose and meaning to their life. Live without fault in such a world working to attain perfection. Now the beauty of this is that it is both something we're commanded to work at and something we acknowledge we will never attain on our own. That righteousness is not something we can attain. We're meant to fix the things in our lives that are out of sync with who Christ wants us to be, the grumbling, the complaining, and yet true righteousness comes from Christ alone, is granted to us as a gift from him. And then we're commanded to work out our own salvation. Verse 14 to 16a. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. There's a word of life in this world. There's perhaps Paul was pointing to the idea that scripture would eventually come together and supernaturally pointing to this idea of there being a word of God in our hands. But I think it's more likely that he's talking about the one who speaks life directly into our hearts. That one who when we come into his presence is able to see us and heal us. That one who when we come into his presence is able to give us an understanding of what this world is around us that speaks life and joy and goodness into our very beings. 16b. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in labor or in vain, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service Coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul ends this section by preparing them for his death, reminding them that there is an eternity that is of greatest value, that the sacrifices we make in this world are of little significance compared to the glory that is to come, and displaying to them what is worthy of sacrificing for that once our hearts are focused on Christ and we're called to action in his name, that there will be a giving up, a sacrifice for his sake. And that the beauty of it is that what we sacrifice is worth it because he is worthy. Behold him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this letter of encouragement from Paul. I thank you, Lord, for this church that he extols for that he extols to move closer to your son, to Christ, that he reminds of who Christ is and was, and that he encourages them to be more like him. I pray, Lord, that in our own hearts we would explore where there is bickering and arguing, where there is jealousy, where there are thoughts and feelings that are not Christ-like. 
Lord, I pray that we would bring those things out of the dark and into your presence, that we would confess them before you. And Lord, that our hearts would be changed, that we could celebrate as we do the things that are difficult in this life, that we would celebrate as we do the tasks that you've set before us. That Lord, rather than treating the things with contempt that you've called us to do, that we would treat them with joy. And Lord, may we support one another in this walk. I'm thankful for this group of believers, God, today more than ever, I think. Lord, I pray that you would unite us to one another, that we could support and encourage one another in working out our faith with fear and trembling, acknowledging you as God and holy, inviting you to change and, cha and transform us, to rewire even how our minds think and our hearts approach life. Lord, in your goodness and graciousness, you created us with the ability to change. And then, Lord, you didn't leave us alone to accomplish it on our own, but sent the Holy Spirit to be here with us, to speak truth into our lives, to convict, and to work about that change within us. Pray, Lord, that we would move closer and closer to you. Lord, that those moments of being in your presence wouldn't just be when we're silently in prayer, but would go with us through our days would be a part of just living here on earth. That we would experience you in the mundane and the little and in the big and difficult times. In your name we pray, amen. I invite the worship team to come lead us once again.
Why don't you stand once again for the benediction from the book of Philippians. Therefore, my dear friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. Go in peace serving him. Amen.